know, with Ami here, I think maybe we'll open up with a couple of your songs. <laughs> we are so honored that you would come and contacted us, and, and our friend Lisa listens to you so much. I think on her iPhone, you're the number one played song of, of all time. She just plays it and plays oh, yeah. it, no matter where she is, in Mexico or here. So, such an honor to have you come and and open up our little gathering tonight. Mm, well, it's, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the, the invitation. And, <laughs> yeah, really wonderful to be here. And I think we'll have the people who will kind of come in, and so we'll just we'll let them come and welcome them in, and as we go on this evening. Okay. song is a song about um, loving the love that we come from, which, um, which for me was a pretty big turnaround from where I started. I started out with a real interest in sitting still in caves and yogis and um, absolutely no interest in devotion or any, anything of that nature. Um, but over the years it kind of flipped. So this is, I love loving you. God is in, God is down, God is here, God is there, and God's right away.
another one? That's uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, us all. Take us all in bathing in the grace. <laughs> I was, um, I lived up in Edmonton, Alberta for a little while. I was, uh, I'm from the Northern California coast, the Mendocino coast, and I was up there for about five years, and the kind of, um, really slow spiritual ballads I was writing weren't going over very well in the, um, the bars and coffee shops of the Alberta Prairie, and, um, so I wrote this one, and I turned it into a little more of a story, but still tried to keep it aligned to what was touching my heart. <coughs> Coming back from the mountains, the kids were sleepy. And I made a left turn onto our street. I parked the car and looked over at you. The smile in your eyes warmed me all the way. Clarity rises like the sun in the sky And it shines in my heart and it shines in my mind And when I remember it's all so clear All that I could ever want is right Out on the back porch I sit distracted Staring out at the stars Feeling cold and contracted And it's a shift that's so small Unnoticed by sight It's a shift inside that sets everything right Clarity rises like the sun in the sky And it shines in my heart and it shines in my mind Out in the moonlight it's all so clear All that I could ever want is right When I return after I've been away Well, I wonder why I would ever stray Cause it's like coming home to what I always knew This love that is real and this peace that is true When I lay down at the end of this life When I lay down at the end of this life What's real will remain and cross through the night Cause what's real lasts and what's real does not and it shines in our hearts and it shines in our minds and clarity rises like the sun in the sky and it shines in our hearts and it shines in our minds and when we remember it's all so clear All that we could ever want It's right here Thank you. Beautiful. What a way.
way to start us off, huh? <laughs> Isn't that lovely? I have to say, I have a group of friends up in Edmonton that are on fire for God. Uh -huh. So if you ever want to go back there, I'll meet you up there. Okay. And they'll be, they'll probably listen to all your whole repertoire. <laughs> with, it'll be like a retranslation of Edmonton. Mm -hmm. I've been up there actually a couple times in the early 2000s, and then I'm going up to Calgary um, coming up in June. And I'm going out to a farm, and they're going to put all the people in the barn. We'll be out there, and and I think there's tent space available, and all mm -hmm. that. We're just going to be out in nature, and going deep into the presence mm -hmm. up there. So it's going to be beautiful. And I had another dear friend, Jeffrey from Edmonton, that I I was rolling through there, and they asked me to speak at a religious science church, and I think they were doing like a Two, two week course on the Buddha, and I went in there and let the spirit rip through me, and it rocked the whole place. Uh, so they were—I don't think they were sure what hit them. Uh, we were, but I thought that's cool. If it's a, if it's a church doing a two-part, a two-week series on the Buddha, they were open-minded. I can cut loose with all the deepest teachings here. So, so I did. <laughs> so, well, we're so grateful that you could all be here. Francis Zhu and myself, some of you know us from things that we share on YouTube, and we're just thrilled uh, to come out. And we love these visits to the Bay Area, and I think they'll probably be more frequent. I'm actually coming out again on May 22nd to be down on Market Street, so <laughs> Khalid drew us out here <laughs> after watching uh, on YouTube for so long, he's like, no, I'm ready for something, come on out, come on out here. So, and then our friends Kirsten and Ricky are coming next next week? Next weekend. Next weekend. Is that up near San Rafael? Yeah. Jen's house? Yeah, it's Jen's house, so that'll be good too. Yeah, we might have some other guests coming tonight too that I heard about. Actually, um, we're the type that we, when we get a, an invitation to lunch, we fly into a city just for an invitation to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's actually with the publishers of A Course in Miracles, mm -hmm. who we really love dearly. So that it's easy enough to draw us out here to the Bay Area, just invite an invitation to lunch. And so we're going to do that tomorrow afternoon. They, we may get to have a little taste of them tonight, I think, or some of them, and they come. So I'll let you all know if they make it here through the Bay Area traffic. <laughs> but um, yeah, and this is your first time out here in a little while. Uh, since last year, yeah. Since last year, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you have anything you want to share with everyone while you, to greet them? Yeah, yeah, it's great to to be here. I just talked with uh, Sundari and telling her that I will be away for half a year for the uh, starting from next month. So it just feels really good to be coming out here and to meet you and share just whatever in the moment that wants to come out I guess. And I was talking to David quite a bit lately um, that I heard Gandhi said that his life is his message and I said that that is so beautiful because what else can we share and what else do we have to teach except our lives you know the way that we we live and the way that we think the way we carry our message is is in everything we do and is in everything um, that we present and we demonstrate this attitude so, so yeah, I just feel very honored to be here and for any opportunity really to be able to be used and share whatever that wants to, to extend out. So I feel like this is my invitation. Please feel free to, to ask any questions and draw it out of this mouth. <laughs> so. It's so beautiful. And Ami's song too, 
so beautiful with God is in and God is out, God is here, God is there. I just had that going through my mind this morning, that, that everything, uh, from A Course in Miracles, there's even a workbook lesson, God is in everything I see. And then the next lesson is, God is in everything I see, because God is in my mind. So we're not talking pantheism, that God dwells in, in tulips, or in this water bottle, or in this TV set, but it's like the presence of love, the presence of God, is in everything I see, because the presence of love is in my mind. And it's really showing us that there is no separation, there is no split, that, that everything is God, in the sense that the presence of love emanates and radiates through us as a beautiful creation of God to everything and everyone, and there really is nothing else. And I know sometimes people will even say to me, if I say that, that God is in everything I see, they'll say, that sounds a little Pollyanna, David, you're getting a little Pollyanna there, and it's actually not. You know, this is actually the truth of it. I'm just stating the fact of it. And so to me, it's, it's what a healed perception, even if you look at the world and you say, my gosh, there's so many images in this cosmos, but actually the, the love is behind the veil. So literally the love radiates in us and through us and out to everything. Our love, the love of God, the love of Spirit reaches everything, and that's what the goal of, you might say, our experience on earth is just to come to a healed perception. Before the veil parts and disappears, and we see that there is only love, then, then we can extend a healed perception, a unified perception. And in quantum physics it's called the unified field, and uh, Rumi also called it the field. There is a field, I will meet you there, the poets, the scientists. Those that are into religion, spirituality, have been echoing this love throughout the ages in poetry, songs, like Emmy singing. You can feel the presence coming through. And so I've been traveling around the world and it's quite delightful for me when I have someone who just shows up and, and gratefully just sings, lets the present just woo through. I had this happen to me um, a number of years ago when I went to Stockholm and I was at a yoga center and a woman I had never met named Caddis um, just came and she brought her guitar and you could just hear a pin drop and everybody just dropped just through her first two songs into the presence of love so quickly, so directly, so easily, like melting butter. And I had never met her, I just, thank you, and I, that's the way to start. <laughs> A gathering, <laughs> all of us dropping in, dripping wet with love, mm -hmm. and continue on with that. So, you know, if some of you know what we're sharing, we're sharing this love, and we're sharing this love has no interruptions, there's no gaps in it, there's no time when it is not there. And, and it's fun to come and join with me, because if anybody comes and they seem to have a problem, then we just join in together and we just see if that problem is still there <laughs> after we join together. You know, like it says, where two or more are gathered in His name, I am there. And to me, that's how it works. That's how the great sages and the great saints and the great healers, the avatars have all worked. They just are aware of the presence of love and then everything and everyone in their presence also experiences that, because they are emanating and radiating that which is. And so, even though I would say these gatherings or satsangs, or whatever you want to call them, uh, are just opportunities to come together, really, and rejoice and celebrate. That's what we are always doing, we're always celebrating. And, and always it's based on, on an invitation. And again, Sadari so graciously opens up her home, and actually in a time of her need, where she was needing the light to come and shine, and, and a light to remember, you know, that's how it works. There's nothing more sacred than, than one who calls and one who answers, because really it's the Spirit that's answering. And so we, we are so grateful that you've called us 
to your home again and to go, come and share this space and and again that's that's reason enough for us to come <laughs> over here to the Bay Area. It doesn't take much. You know, we're we hear the call and we're on the plane. <laughs> we're here for you. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I hear some more people coming. We'll let them come on in too. Hi David. <laughs> come on in. You don't have to whisper, just come and join the crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, just the glee of, of the life that we're given when we give our life over to Spirit. You know, that's the thing that's so beautiful. And just the happiness, you know, we feel so called, and it's been such a calling for me for so long, that, that everything just seemed to merge and, and unify, and then, you know, it's, it's, I'm quite clueless of uh, every day what will happen, where I'll go, what I'll do. It's just wonderful to not really have a clue of, of how your day is going to go and, and live in that state of, I do not know anything of this world, because the presence of love is really what it's all about anyway. So, it has been a life of trust and a lot of times uh, when Francis and I come and we come upon invitation and we speak, it, it seems to cause, it seems to stir things up a bit in the world because we're be basically echoing what Jesus taught and, and teaches that I'm calling you out of the thinking of the world and it's possible to live a life of, of complete trust, <coughs> and when you live in that complete trust, everything flows in your awareness very beautifully. It's like all things do work together for good. It's the state of mind where there absolutely are no problems. We're talking about a, a practicality. We're not talking about a pie in the sky. We're not talking about a fantasy world. We're talking about the presence of love. Some call it healing, some call it wholeness, some call it completion. You can really call it what you want. But it's beautiful in that state because there are no enemies. There is nothing to contest. Uh, the Spirit can use all the symbols of the world, but it's using everything fully for the purpose of expressing the unity, expressing the love. There is no other purpose for any image in the cosmos. No other purpose for a tulip, for a rose, for a candle, for a light. Everything shares the same purpose. And this is a big turnaround from the idea that everything has a different purpose. Everyone has a different name, every object has a different name and all of the complex configurations of this world. Because ever, though we've been raised with that kind of thinking, it hasn't really brought us peace. It hasn't brought us satisfaction. It hasn't brought us contentment. So we're actually enjoying this experience of being totally given over to Spirit. And it's nice when we share because uh, some have shared, uh, Khaled was saying he's watched the YouTubes and he met Francis for the first time and he said, Oh, I heard your stories, yeah, yeah, you were, you were married, you had, had this, you had that, and he gave it all up and now look at you. <laughs> She's got a big smile on her face. And so there's practicalities to that, not that, not that there's sacrifice, not that there's anything actually, truly, really to give up in this state of mind. It's, it's simply that you have a sense of integrity, you have a sense of wholeness and completion, in which you see that you have and are everything. That who you are, the state of mind that you are, is everything. And it's not missing anything. And so I would say, to the ego it seems like a giving up, like you actually had something and then it's gone now. When actually I would say everything is simply, perception becomes integrated and you realize that what you thought you had, you never really had. 
therefore you can't really lose anything. You can only have the illusion of giving up. Mm. And that's been the way. That was the intense step, I guess, when every time I share my story, people, the, the most, this, uh, stir, you know, people got stirred up mainly, and the question that people want to ask is, is that has to be the way to go about awakening? Do I have to give up? And so much so that now we're talking, can we, can we go on? Can we, that is the beginning, really. <laughs> that isn't the big deal. Can we actually just get started? Because there's so much to go through, through, you know, mm -hmm. after that. The seeming letting go of what we value and what we <coughs> think brings us security and the things that we have accumulated and possessed as if there's an identity that can possess anything, just through letting them go, then whatever that is buried and, and hidden underneath can have a chance to be brought to awareness. You know, that is the way that it works, is that we, we're so afraid to face what is underneath, we're fooling ourselves, thinking we're afraid of letting go things. We're not afraid to let go things. We're afraid to face what is underneath and why we, we're so caught up in accumulating all of it in the first place. There's a, there's a huge self-deception that is going on. And really, you know, after I stepped into that seeming letting go, then the underneath reasons and fear and emotion were allowed to come to, to, to the surface. And that was the beginning of healing. Because when they are hidden and when they are protected and defended, there is no chance of healing. There's just so much that's underneath, underneath that. And there's a huge fear of realizing who we are. You know, it's not like we're <clears throat> begging the spirit to tell us who we are. We are constantly fighting and protesting, you know, protecting this identity, this self-made identity. Just say, no, don't. Don't show me it's too frightening. And I'm going to use all kinds of ex excuses and distractions to stop that awareness to come. You know, so this is really not about a form or a formula. This is a message that we're saying that this is not a pathway of sacrifice. This is not a pathway of, of giving, giving up anything that's real. It's actually a pathway of giving everything, giving up everything that is causing us pain and suffering. Truly, that is the experience that can come out of it. And that seems to be, that, that love is so important because that love provides us the safety that love provides us security, not the, the jobs and the investments and the possessions, not protecting things, not defending things, but coming with open hands and open arms unto thy God. And to me that's a living presence. It's so safe. It's so safe. It's an invitation. It's the love is saying, it's okay, you can, you can not hold up the mask anymore. You don't have to uh, try to protect anything. Uh, we have a monastery out in rural Utah, way out in rural Utah, and uh, I think it was maybe, I don't know, a couple weeks ago I was invited to go there and I, I came into the sanctuary and there was a group there and I was just going to be with them, sit in presence with them for, you know, a couple hours and just uh, see if anything came through. And, and then one by one there was exposure, crying, lots of crying, wailing. You know, it's fun when you go and you hear wailing. It was just wailing, wailing. And, and it was so beautiful. And then after those uh, couple hours, I ended up uh, saying, I want to find a song. If we, had, we used the iPhone to search and find the song. And it was uh, Sarah McLachlan's Fumbling Towards Ecstasy. Uh, it's an, actually an album, and that says a song on it. And the, the line repeats in the chorus, I won't fear love. She just pours, her, like she's just pouring her whole heart and soul into I won't fear love. So healing. 
And then everyone, all the tears cleared, all the smiles came out. It was like all the clouds blew by and there was just such radiant happiness that was allowed to come into awareness by not holding on to the sadness, not holding on to the grief, not holding on to that heavy, heavy experience that was behind all the crying and the wailing. How wonderful! It's just no different than if you've, you've been through a, a very hot day and you're, you're hot and you're sweaty and you take, you take a nice cool shower at the end of the day before you go to bed. To, to be rinsed, to be cleansed, to have all those pores opened wide before you go to sleep so you can have a nice sound sleep. You know, that's the allowance, that's what love is. And that's the most important thing, you know, the love is beyond the teachings, it's beyond the words, it's beyond the techniques, it's beyond the practices. It's just so safe and so inviting. And that's really what our life has pretty much turned into. We, there's travels to meet people, there's welcoming people that come and seem to live with us. It's, all that's just a backdrop of, of allowing the love to, to flow freely, not holding anything in, in, that would hold it back, that would confine it. It's so delicious, you know, that's, I think of uh, Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss. <laughs> Those were wise words, wise words, follow your heart, follow your bliss. See that there's nothing that can hold you back from that experience. So it's a transformation of consciousness, really, that, that comes about. Mm. There's some more people. Trickle. This is the trickle in. Dari's got just the right amount of chairs and stools here. So we're really here at the service of love, at, at your service, and so, so grateful to be able to to just share this presence together. And Dari's brought a few more pillows, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. We've got two couches if you feel to recline in and also... <laughs> Very good. Comforter has arrived. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting you uh, talking about you. I won't be afraid of love because my sister she's visiting, and uh, she lives in Quebec. I don't see her that often, and uh, we sleep in the same bed because that's how in my family we used to sleep close together. We're four sisters and we're, we're very close and and. Um, so one night we go to bed and I just feel like I love her. I just feel like so much love and gratitude and then it's like like I want to communicate it but at the same time like no you can't say that. You know, and the, the voice is there like don't say you love her. And uh, <laughs> cuz that's the way it I, it's kind of the way it was or whatever I believe in and so I, I just it was just so strange, like this, this the fear. And <coughs> this, I, I won't be afraid of love. This I've been doing. Pray, I've been praying on this for the past couple of days, and uh, also like we have a um, like com I join your companions, and then so last night we went to bed. I just felt it again, and I said, I told her I, said, I love you very much, and then she said, and then she said, I'm so happy to be here. Uh. I just uh, I'm emotional. <laughs> And it just, it was just so uh, great, it was a great feeling to experience. And sometimes I, I uh, prevent myself from leaving it, like I have this fear. So I'm so happy you talked about not being afraid of love, because that's something we, uh, uh, somehow, I think we need to promote, you know, don't be afraid of love. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I'm, I'm happy you're sending us this message. <laughs> mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> Oh, there we go. There's two that will recline. Sandari <laughs> always welcomes everybody. Food's out, soft couches, chairs. Come, come. She's welcoming everyone. Yeah. yeah, it's great because uh, guilt is a it's a very subtle motivator, but um, 
I've noticed for a lot of people when they start to get honest and look at their consciousness and look at their life, they notice that that their a lot of their actions throughout their life was was motivated by fear or guilt. It's interesting when you ever when you really step back far enough to look at that and then there's something inside that just rises up and says it doesn't have to be that way. <coughs> we can be motivated by love, motivated by joy, motivated by happiness. And then this other voice can say, well, that'll work so far, but what about jobs and careers and, and responsibilities and duties? You know, that, that voice will always answer that loving thought like, ooh, what, what life would be like to be in so inspired that every action Every single action was motivated by, by love and happiness and joy. And I, I say it is just a matter of trust because I, after I had that honest introspection and started to see how much the majority of my actions had been motivated by fear, then I began trusting. And um, when I trusted, I started to call in a lot of witnesses. I always talk about that passage from A Course in Miracles. It, it says, once you have accepted His plan as the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you. Without your effort, He will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on, no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you, not one seeming difficulty will, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing except the only purpose you would fulfill. To me that was like lilies of the field. Look at the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor toil. Mm -hmm. and, and all those wonderful passages, that is a living experience and it's always available to us for trust. All we have to do is put our trust in it. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. That's the kind of trust that you need to experience presence consistently. And Frances was just sharing in her life, you know, with different things that you had. You had a house and a husband and a business and then owned your own business. And a lot of the things that the world would say, oh, very good, oh, good, got married, oh, got a house, good, good business. But so, oh, your own business, even better. You know, there's like a little ladder of check, 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 check that you're supposed to be more successful, more safe, more secure, more happy even, if you can check certain boxes. And I think it, it went different in my life because I was more like a, a hobo. <laughs> Francis did it the, the way that you're supposed to do it. I was a hobo. I, I kind of went around, you know, I didn't have like a Buddha begging bowl, but there was never anything in my account. That's why I never checked do you check your account balance? No, I don't ever do that. <laughs> I'm not interested in my account balance. It's not impressive. It never will be impressive. It never was impressive and never will be impressive. And, and so, you know, I, but I had been caught in academia. I was in university for 10 years and undergrad and graduate school and, da -da -da and degrees and all this and that. So, so what do you usually get when you spend 10 years full-time in university. PhD. No, you, no, you get in debt is what you get. Uh, that's, I will speak for the majority of the students in the world when I say that if you spend ten years if you spend ten years in university, I'm talking full time, you are in debt. Mostly, right? I mean that's that's speaking for most people. This is a very rare one that were had sugar daddy and something, you know, that you know and so, but that was good too because then I thought, okay, spirit, now what? And it's like, you know, it's like we have to unwind you from, from the world, we have to unwind you from debt because debt is not an idea that comes from the Creator. Debt actually is where guilt comes in. If you believe in debt, if you believe in lack, then you, believe, you experience guilt. And that can be a motivator in your life, you know. Some of those songs, work my finger to the bones, you know. Well, working your fingers to the bones is usually coming from guilt, you know. I mean, I, I, the lives of lots, lots of the mystics and saints, they're just singing a song. And you don't, you, like these roses don't look like they're working their finger to the bone. They're just like, <laughs> they've got it made. Even their stems are cut and, and 
Sundari's got them in water, they're, they're just drinking in the water, just radiating, and they're just having a good time and enjoying themselves, but they're not like struggling and striving here. Even with their stems cut, they're, they're just having a great time here, I can tell, I'm feeling the vibe. But, but that's the thing, we have to come out of that mentality of work, strive, suffer, you know, because that's not what God intended for us in creation. God intended us for us to be happy, and, and not the kind of happiness that comes from achieving certain kind of outcomes in the world. We're talking eternally happy, like happy for no earthly reason. In fact, that was my goal, was just, I, I wouldn't be content until I was happy for no earthly reason. Because when you, when you watch the birds singing, they're not singing because they found some food, or they're not singing because they found a mate or something, they're singing because they're happy. They just chirp, chirp, chirp away, you know, they just, they're, they're chirping. We want to be chirping away as well, in everything we think and say and do. So I came the hobo route and she came more the build it all up and then let it all go route. <laughs> just as fearful, you know, when you're talking about that, I've never been in debt and I've been like accumulating, accumulating, accumulating and constantly in fear just constantly in fear, until the moment I let it all go, suddenly for the first time in my life, I didn't have fear about money anymore when I let it all go. So that was such a contrast and I would never have believed in it unless I experienced it firsthand. So it's just, you know, the more that we accumulate and we defend some self concept or self-identity, the more fear we're in. So. Yeah. And I think the more that you go into this, the more that you trust, the more you can relax and, and be clueless about, about your day. You know, you, you can, when you see people, you can hug them, you can greet them, you can smile, you can laugh very freely, because you don't have an agenda. You know, if, if you're into sales, there's this motive of selling something in the background, and it can get very stressful. If there's a competition motive, if there's an, it's actually if there's an agenda to get anything from anyone, I found that that's how the mind works. The mind is so powerful that if you have a desire to get something from the world, if you want something from the world, it will seem that the world wants something from you. And, and it's so, such a glorious life to just show up in, in full giving mode and then watch the reflections. Everything just seems to be so abundantly there, but you have no control over any of it. You know, some of you know the serenity prayer from 12 Steps, and, and um, there's a version of that uh, in the Course near the, the Rules for Decision where Jesus says, you have no control over the world you made. What does that mean, you have no control over the world you made? It means, number one, that, that there was a, some kind of a crazy puff in your mind that you believed in that projected this whole strange time-space cosmos. That love didn't create this world. That, that mm -hmm. certainly went against my Christian upbringing. Mm -hmm. You know, Genesis, mm -hmm. God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. And I finally started to realize God created the heavens, God created the heavens, <laughs> and what about earth? Well, if we give it back, if we give over the projection and we say, help me with this cosmos, help me with all these projected differences, it will unify and we'll see heaven reflected on earth, we'll see a unified world where it's all is in harmony, but, but the actual Earth, the projection of separate images and everything, came from the ego, it came from falsity, it's, it came from a puff of nothingness. So, so actually, it's really important to come to that distinction in your mind, where you see, okay, I admit it, I have no control <coughs> over the world I made. Because that making, that inventing, that fiction, that fantasy, that fabrication was coming from the ego, and I'm opening to learn that I am not an ego, I am a creation of a perfect loving God. And therefore I can let go of trying to control the world. 
What are the benefits of letting go of trying to control the world? Well, it certainly helps with your partner and your spouse. If you're not trying to control them, you're going to have a lot more happiness and peace. The other thing is if you quit trying to control the body. As long as you think you are personally responsible for the body and you've got to make sure you feed it and get the right nutrition in it and it gets enough sleep and this and this, it can get really stressful trying to live a healthy life doing all the right things for that body. It's like a pressure, like, ooh, if I slip up, I could get a disease, I could, I could have to pay for that slip up. The Spirit is saying, no, you need, to, you need to let go of the reins and the control and realize that miracles are involuntary and when you serve the glory of the Lord, if you serve Spirit, if you serve God, things will just seem to happen, but it will be more like you're watching, you're like the witness self, watching the world. You're not trying to control it, you're not trying to change it, you're trying, not trying to fix it. Seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. I was just at a conference in Las Vegas and that was the theme of the whole conference. Change your mind, change the world. And what fun, you know, I have fun in Vegas because I, I'm just watching the world. I got to watch all the sights and images and you know, it was fun going back to Vegas. The first time I went to Vegas, the Spirit had me on the highway driving towards California. I came right to the exit where it was Las Vegas. The Spirit had me pull off on the exit. I, I went a couple blocks toward Vegas. There was a big building with one of these digital TV screens on it that was like two stories high. And it was a wedding scene. It was a, it was a bride and a groom and there was rice flying and there was all these people and it was a wedding scene. And then the whole wedding scene disappeared and it came up into this deep royal blue, called Course in Miracles Blue. And I just sat there watching the whole thing and then this one word rose up in big, like white letters, illusion. And it stopped and I just was there, just looking at <laughs> illusion with all this blue and illusion. This is my visit to Vegas. This is how the Holy Spirit takes me to Vegas. And then... <laughs> Light turns green, I'm guided to turn left, I'm guided to turn left again, I'm guided I'm back on the highway and I'm on my way to California. That's all I got from <laughs> Vegas. That was my entire experience of Las Vegas. That's how it started. That's probably all I could handle at that point. <laughs> I'm not going back to Vegas till I have some mind training <laughs> and, and then filled with presents. Then I can go and enjoy Vegas. Because then I have something to extend. I have a lot to extend. But, I, but if I was going to Vegas to get something, I, I certainly got my message and then off you go to California now. <laughs> go out to Bakersfield and over there, you know, it went on. So, so that's what we're saying is, uh, you know, there's a line that, from the Course that really inspired me. It's, it said, what is temptation but the wish to make illusions real? I thought, now that's a great definition of, of temptation. What is temptation but the wish to make illusions real? What does that mean? That would be, what is temptation but the wish to make the temporary eternal? When all that the Spirit is asking is, is focus your mind on the everlasting. The one question you can ask yourself with anything in this world is, is it passing or is it everlasting? And as you keep using that as your discernment, you start to realize that what you have within you and that you've always had within you and what is radiating through you and what is truly who you are is eternal and it shall never pass away. Those that drink of me shall never see death. What if you practically live that in every single moment of every day? Those that see me shall never pass away. Drink of me and you will thirst no more. That's worth it. That's worth it. And that to me is the same thing that Buddha taught, that's what all the sages and mystics say. Empty your mind, simply do this, be still, lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is. All concerns, all doubts, all worries, all regrets, all ambitions, that, that's why I kind of started off in the hobo 
line of work and then and ended up in the hobo line of work. Because my ambition is zero. Am I an entrepreneur? No. Am I a capitalist? No. Socialist? No. I, I am into presence. I'm into love. I'm into joy. And how do I keep love and joy and happiness and peace in my mind? How do I keep it there? By giving it away. And by not letting my mind drift into these things that were just meaningless, superficial thoughts of nothingness. That's why I have no opinions. People say, well, who are you going to vote for in the presidential election? Vote? <laughs> you think I'm a dualist? <laughs> you really believe I'm a dualist? Well, you want to make a difference in the world, do I? <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, the candidates have such varying views. Do they? I woke up with my Course in Miracles lesson, which I recorded. I record one every day and I send it out. And it was something like, today I will perceive no differences. See what that does to your politics. <laughs> today I will perceive no differences. This lesson 200 and something. I'm fully into that. I'm fully into that. Lesson 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want. I've had people that shut the book on that lesson. They, did, they missed out 129, it's a great lesson, but they shut the book on 128. They said, I, that's not true. I don't believe that. And I said, oh, but 129 is so beautiful. What was that? Beyond this world is a world I want. Beyond this world is a new way of seeing the world. Where I'm not craving and grabbing and trying to get, get, get. Without, without the getting motive, this world is beautiful. It is spectacular when we're in give mode. When all we do is we, like the flower, we let the fragrance go. We don't try to direct where the fragrance goes. We don't try to direct the gift. The flower gives the gift freely. And when we give our love freely, we experience the full extent of that love. We don't try to limit it, we don't try to tie it down, and so on and so forth. So to me, everything that I've experienced is extremely practical, and, and it's quite a joy, we have quite a joy at sharing that. It's, it's practical spirituality, it's not pie in the sky, it's not wishing, hoping, Maybe, maybe, that sounds good. Sentimentally, yeah, that kind of, that's good, sentimentally. Sentimentally what? We're not into sentimentality either. That's just time. It's the presence of love that's here and now that is everything. So, yeah, that's why we're here. We, we are showing up in love. We're showing up to share a beautiful, joyful message in that when you give, when you fully give and you don't have a motive of getting something in return, that's, there's nothing more, more joyful. Those are my favorite parables, are the giving parables. Of going off with Kirsten, Kirsten's writing a book, I Married a Mystic, from her year, years ago with me, but I remember we went to Wisconsin that time and she had spent quite a few hours back in the days with CDs, making CDs, and stomping CDs. You remember, do you ever remember the stomping CDs where you, you got to record the CD, then you got to put a label on it, you know. We were so simple when we stomped them, we put white labels on them and we hand wrote. <laughs> this was the day. This was past the days of cassettes. This is when we were stomping CDs and we hand wrote on them. And she had stomped a whole bunch of, of CDs and we went to a little church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Don't you like that name? Sheboygan. <laughs> Isn't that a happy name? Sheboygan. I like names that I like to say. Like I like from the Bible, I like the, I like the, the, the word for a grave. Sepulchre. I like that. Sepulchre. Sheboygan. Uh, so I, I was in Sheboygan and we were in the church and I gave the whole thing. And usually in my talks at the end, I would talk about, freely we have received now freely give, freely I give, everything's for free. It was one of my talks where it's a free treat. The person was like, just tone it down a little bit, because I've got my CDs here, and you know, we want people to come up. And So I remember I was talking, free, free, free. She's like, at the very end, okay, right, right. 
And then a woman who had been there, I think it was a Hispanic woman who had been there, she had to leave. So she went over, Kirsten had laid out all these CDs, and I had given the free, free, free thing, and she took her hand and she scooped, she went along and scooped as many CDs as she could get in her hand. In total glee, she scooped, <laughs> and I watched her, and she was like, and she went and she scooped and she got a whole handful and she went running out the door before Kirsten could even get to the table. And Kirsten was horrified that her, all of her stomping, not take one CD or throw something in a donation basket, or she just scooped. I think, I hope that makes it into the book. That was one of my, I love those parables where I'm going on and on about free, 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 and then somebody actually feels me and goes, thank you, and scoops, you know. Because if from a business sense, the scoop, that's not a good scoop, you know. That's a lot of, of profit, or whatever you want to call it, scooped away. But she went out the door with such happiness and glee, and I loved it. I also loved a gathering, years ago I went to one of these um, summer solstice things, I think at the Cincinnati Zoo, and this guy came and he spoke in such grace and presence, the whole talk. His name was George. He was part of Emissaries of Light. And I sat there and I just, oh, I loved his talk. And I was just like, oh, God, that is so good. And I was so happy and smiling. And then at the end, he said, there's a basket at the back by the door. And he said, if I do all my work on a donation basis, so if anybody wants to donate, please feel free to put something in the basket when you're going out. I'd heard that spiel a hundred times. So that was okay. I still was in joy. And then he said, and if you're hurting and you have financial difficulty or anything, you feel free to take anything you want out of that basket on the way out. And I went, yo, now there we go. There we go. There's somebody who's really living in divine providence. I'd heard the other spiel a hundred times, but I never heard that. That lit me up. That lit me up so much that I went, I want to live my life like that. George, and George just passed away, I think a couple years ago, some friends said he was so happy too, he just, mm -hmm. I think he was just, lived his life so happy and he lived in some community, I think in Colorado and Emissaries of Light. His name, isn't that a, a lovely name? Mm -hmm. I would love to just visit a community, Emissaries of Light, that name would draw me in. I don't care what their creed is or whatever, I'd go visit Emissaries of Light. Jimmy Twyman, I just, he was with us recently, he, he wrote his, a book, Emissaries of Light, about the silent brotherhood in Croatia, and, every, and some people were wondering, is that fact or fiction? Who cares? Who cares, really? It's all fiction. It's all fiction. There's no facts in this world. God is a fact. Love is a fact. Peace is a fact. Those are some, joy is a fact, but the rest is fiction. You know, the rest is passing. It's ephemeral. Everything about the cosmos. I mean, I love studying science too, and, and at one point when I was studying science, then I realized that, that they, one of the principles was that the entire cosmos was, was moving into chaos. What do they call that? The second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> there, I, I, we got a chemist in the, Thermo in the class. En entropy. <laughs> Entropy. entropy. Everything in the cosmos is moving to chaos. Isn't that wonderful? You know why that's wonderful? Because we're beyond the cosmos. We weren't created to be trapped in a, in a time-space cosmos. So I was happy when they said entropy is everything is moving to chaos. I didn't get depressed by that. I thought, well, that's good. It doesn't concern me. I'm not concerned with the beginning or anything of this world. And I think that's where the joy comes in, when, when you just can watch the world without a sense of having to feel a responsibility towards it. We are responsible for our state of mind, by the way. Not for the entropy, but for our state of mind. So to me, that's good. Practical, practical teachings. And the second law of thermodynamics. Question. Yes. I don't want to interrupt. Oh no, this is great. So, I love questions. <laughs> so when you say we are responsible for our state of mind, no, not. oh, so I'm just curious to know, like when I heard uh, David say we are responsible for our state of mind, I'm just curious to know, like who is the we? 
Well, I would say it's, it's our mind is responsible for the peace and the happiness and joy. In other words, everything to me comes down to acceptance. And, you know, like Byron Katie calls it loving what is, mm -hmm. you know, what is, is, is love, is yeah. the peace, joy and happiness. And there's a responsibility for that. In other words, I love it when people bring up topics, like some people, I went to Ireland and I was, they had me in this room and it was a really cold room. Everybody was there, everyone's, you could see their breath in <laughs> Ireland, and it was cork. And I'm sitting in a cork and I'm in there with a bunch of Irish people and you can see the breath, fowls from Ireland. And then I was talking to them and, and I love it, I love questions and I waited, one of the questions was, speak of the devil! Speak on the devil. So I did. I love to talk about the devil. Uh, I'll talk about anything. Or talk about sin. Now, what does the sin and the devil have to do with our state of mind? Well, it has a lot to do with our state of mind. If we're in any way lined up with the devil, or with the ego, or with sin, it doesn't matter what name. I'm not shy about names. People say, oh, don't use that word sin, David, please. Don't use it. And don't use death either. Just tell, just say people make their transition. Don't ever use the word death. We, we, shan't, we can't be afraid of these words. I'm happy to use sin, devil, death, anything, you know. I don't believe in them, so that makes it, I can speak with some authority, uh, the authoritativeness of spirit. Because there is no death, because there is no sin, but to take responsibility for your state of mind means you have to go in your mind and you have to see absolutely, positively, without compromise, beyond error, beyond error, beyond, call it sin if you want, beyond error. So the, the state of mind that, that is peace, you might say, is, is our reality. That's, which self is it? That's the real self. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only self that there is. And the self that, <coughs> will say believes it's a personality self, on a timeline, and so on and so forth. That self is nothing and nowhere. That, that self can kind of puff itself up. It's pretty good at that, you know. Oh, I got these degrees, and I got this, and money in the bank, possessions, and, and I can speak this language, and that language, and I can do... You know, that little self tries to make itself into something real. But it really isn't. It's basically completely inconsequential. It, there's no reality. I mean, even some spiritualities like to say that each human being is a unique, individual, divine expression of, of God. I, I used to believe that kind of stuff, but I'm not into particles anymore. <laughs> I'm not into subatomic particles, personality particles, or whatever. I'm, I'm seeing that the wholeness, the wholeness is what God is. The wholeness of, is what Christ is. The wholeness is, is our real identity. And that wholeness has a responsibility to itself to be itself. You know, we, we have a responsibility to be happy because God created us happy. There's a responsibility to that. In The Course in Miracles it says, when God created you as the Christ, it wasn't a passive thing. You actually answered with the affirmative. You actually answered with a yes. And when you say yes to the Creator, oh, it's true and real. You, you are in a divine pact of happiness. <laughs> and there is no other option but to be happy in who you are. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, it's God's will that this happened. It's God's will that that happened. God's will that that country got invaded. It's God's will that the hurricane hit here. No, no, no. God's will has nothing to do with events of hurricanes and tsunamis and things of time and space. God's will for you is perfect happiness. That's God's will. And in all this stuff about not my will but thine, those were just, remember the prayers of St. Francis and some of the saints? They were just saying, please, I don't want to identify with the ego anymore. Not my will but thine be done. Mm -hmm. Thy will be done. But, God answers, thy will is my will. Not the ego, but who you are, your will for perfect happiness is perfectly aligned with, with the Creator. Isn't that wonderful? That God is 
creates only perfect happiness. I like that. To me, that, that's the kind of theology. I'll, if that's the only line in the theology, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> because there, what's, where's the sin in that? Where's the error in that? Now, I've spent the last 25 years talking about the belief in sin, the belief in error, the belief in fear, you know, because it's, it's practical. I have a friend who just wrote me today, and she's in Delhi, speaking to a huge auditorium full of Indian people over in, in Delhi, India, and she's giving a talk on, uh, on A Course in Miracles, and somebody asked the question, like, I think it was, how did the ego happen? I call that the number one question, how did the ego happen? And, and so, she finally said, the Son of God forgot to laugh. That's how she answered the question. Mm -hmm. Forgot to laugh. You know, that took it seriously. If we have a powerful mind and we take sin or error or fear seriously, then you get a time-space cosmos. And when you actually say, I'm not going to have a scrap left of that thought system, I'm not going to hold on to a scrap of it, I'm going to let thine eye be single, I'm going to align with my Creator, I'm going to live a life of happiness and joy, because that's how I was created. That it's actually arrogant to be fearful. It's arrogant to be guilty. Because why? Because God created you perfect, and if you believe you're something other than that perfection, it's the most arrogant thing that could ever be. David. Hi, David. Francis. Yeah. Good to see you again. Um, Somewhere in the Course it says something about love is the same. There's no, in love there's no difference, it's just all love is the same. Mm -hmm. And when I like listen to V, I I feel like she loves her sister different than she loves me. Or loves her daughter maybe even different than that. So I don't know, could you say something about this idea of all love is the same? And, and it seemed like it used the word same. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love that. My friend Rusted wrote a song from the angels. We are the same, not different. We are the same, not separate. Sameness is real, differences are insane. This is, a, <laughs> this is a, I mean, it, it's got such a nice melody and the angels really get it right. They always hit it right on. <laughs> differences are insane. I was just talking to Francis about that because a lot of times, I mean, here we are out in the Bay Area in San Francisco and a lot of times, there's this sense of, we have to accept diversity, we have to accept differences. I don't understand that. I don't understand even what that means, accept differences. Or people have said, we just have to learn how to agree to disagree. That doesn't sound good to me. That doesn't sound good to me at all. Because why? We are the same, not separate. That, that when the ego made this world, it, it threw out a witness of separation of differences. That's what most human beings perceive as all differences. And what is that covering over? Well, in the mind, there are two purposes, and I could call those two purposes love and fear, or spirit and ego, but the mind pushed that out of awareness, dissociated itself from this, these love and fear, and then projected out the, the split of consciousness, because love and fear, let's face it, don't go together. You know, you won't hear Jesus singing, you can't have one without the other. He's not going to be singing <laughs> that. Not with love and fear. Love is real and fear isn't. So he's not going to say you can't have one without the other. In fact, he has a different tune. He says, bring them together in your mind and one will disappear. We have an analogy in this world, light and darkness. Do you never notice how light and darkness don't exist? Einstein, one time, you know, there was a professor that was trying to tell a young Einstein that, that evil was real and darkness was real, and he said, no, no, it's not. You know, dark, there is no such thing as darkness, Einstein said, it's just the absence of light. You can't define anything by saying the absence of, mm -hmm. Einstein said. That's, that's crazy. He basically told the professor he was crazy to think <laughs> that there was something called evil. And, and basically that is, 
But what we're doing with this thing, if you have a split in your mind and you bring the split together in the mind, then light and darkness don't coexist, only one is real. But if you keep that hidden, if you try to retain the split in consciousness, and you see a world of duality and separation and differences, then what you've simply done is you've failed to forgive the error. You've fail, failed to bring the error, the darkness, to the light. Because the darkness will be gone once you bring it to the light. So really, that's what I'm saying is that I spent my life, I devoted my life to just bringing unconscious darkness to the light. And it does disappear. And that's where the happiness comes in. You realize that you were actually happy all along. But only when you believed in the ego did you believe you were sad, or afraid, or guilty. But you're not the ego. You, you, you start to realize when you, don't, when you don't hide the ego anymore, it goes. It's just gone. It, it never was there in the first place. So, that's what I like about seeing sameness in, this, in the sense that in order to know divine love, agape love, unconditional love, you have to let this sameness kind of sweep across everything in perception. That means you let go of beautiful and ugly, fast, slow, hot, cold, good, bad, right, wrong. You have to let go of morality, you have to let go of ethics, you have to let go of everything. Everything you think you think, everything you think you know. Sounds like Buddha. Buddha said, empty the mind, go into the void. Jesus said, empty the mind, go into the void. Ah, kingdom of heaven! <laughs> you see? That's all, he just added that little extra part. Because he experienced that, the I am-ness. Before Abraham was, I am. He, he got through the void and ooh, it's full, it's everything. It's light, it's love, it's joy. And, and to me, that's our practicality. Now you're using V as an example. She's probably happy any time that, lo that love springs out of her. Like, she's, one night she's thinking, Ooh, I'm just going to go hug my sister and love her. Ooh, we'll sleep in the same bed like we did when we were little girls. And, and, and the voice is going, no, no, don't love her. Don't say that. Don't say that to her. Don't, don't, don't. And then finally she gives in. She goes, I love you. And oh, it's just so wonderful when we give in to the love. When we express what's in our heart, it was, ooh, ooh, ooh. It was, so it's just, everybody's practicing doing that with, mm -hmm. with everyone and everything. Just one quick, so if you're in that I am-ness, then you, would you love everyone the same? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, of course. <coughs> That's what love is. Uh -huh. Love doesn't have any exceptions, and love doesn't have any degrees, and love doesn't have any hierarchies, you know, it's, it's, it, to be what itself, it can't have any, it can't have any exceptions. Um, yeah, oh, uh, can we speak on um, how we punish ourselves to circumvent God's punishment? Imaginary ego, right? Because you've heard that in the Course and stuff. Yes, like we use the word mitigate, like, like when we're children and we've done, I think we've done something wrong and we fear punishment from our parents, sometimes the child will say, don't do it mom, don't do it, you know, I'll, I'll go without allowance, I'll go to my room, you know, it's almost like a, a thing like, oh there's a greater punishment coming, so I'll d dish it out, <laughs> I'll be the one dishing <laughs> here, because I don't want to face what, whatever is there, and yeah, that's, that's a dynamic that we feel with, with the way it works in the mind, we feel the ego belief is somehow I deserve to be punished. You know, sin, guilt, fear, you know, it's like an unholy trinity. If, if I believe in wrongness, if something's gone wrong, then I'll, I'll have guilt and I'll fear punishment. Because that's part of the crazy system. So, yeah, that I know, that's again part of those motivations of trying to mitigate, be a good little boy, be a good little girl, do the right things, act the right way, except nobody has any universal agreement on what that is, if you look at all the different cultures. Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to behave like good little boys and girls, and good men and women. And it's crazy, you know, it's a crazy, because nobody seems to be able to reach that standard. You know, they still feel that underneath. Did it I wanted to share a little miracle, if that's okay. Uh, lots of little things have been 
working out for me in my life lately. <clears throat> but there was this one little thing that really struck me the other day. I was going for a walk <laughs> about an hour, and uh, I decided on this walk I would I would have my lunch, and I was going to stop at McDonald's. So then I'm thinking, now, now what am I going to have? Okay, well, and I'm trying not to eat too much. <laughs> I mean. I'm still trying to take care of the body, and I'm not doing a very good job, but anyway. <laughs> so I'm thinking, um, well, they have this uh, 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 double cheeseburger, a simple double cheeseburger on their special uh, value menu. Uh, and they used to be like a dollar, but now they're like two dollars or something. Mm -hmm. Not that that's a lot of money, but... <laughs> and I thought, well, uh, yeah, you know, I, I really want to have... Uh, maybe I should have two. No, no, I'll just have one. Then I just put it out of my mind. I get to McDonald's. What do I see? They have this two for two fifty <laughs> double cheeseburgers. <laughs> so I have two double cheeseburgers <laughs> for only fifty cents more. Only fifty cents more. <laughs> what is that? We do the math on that. That's a pretty, pretty big discount. Yeah, it was. You know, as, as I say, it was just it's just a little thing, and I, I just put it out of my mind and. <laughs> It just worked out fine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that, that is illustrating how, how spiritual principle works in the sense that, that I found when I wasn't chasing after all kinds of things, that it, as I went through this purification process, that the spirit knew the ego preference structure of David. Mm -hmm. The spirit knows everything. Mm -hmm. It's like that says, you don't miss a thing, I do, you see everything. You know, it's, the spirit even knows the ego preference system, and then when your mind, which is still split and needing healing, turns toward the light, the angels all rejoice. It's standing ovation from the angels. Yes, it's turned, oh, here it comes, it's coming back. You know, it's big celebration in heaven, and angels cheering, and then you're just making your turn, you know. You still have got a long way to go. You're just making the turn. But everyone's cheering, standing ovation from the angels and everything, and then, the spirit uses your preference, ego preference system, to bestow miracles. Mm -hmm. I call them whims, mm -hmm. and then you get tons of whims, mm -hmm. like that. Two double cheeseburgers <laughs> for only two fifty. Whims. That's almost back to the old price. That's really close to the old price. So you see how that works. The spirit's like, ooh, thank you so much for making that turn. You're just practicing, you're studying, you're working on forgiving, forgiving Christine, you know, you're doing all this work. He works hard for the Spirit, so hard for the Spirit, he works hard for the Spirit, so you better treat him right. He's trying his best to forgive Christine, and it's a really a, a full-time job. And then when he's out finally taking a breather, and he's going to McDonald's, the Spirit's like, mm -hmm, David, I am very well aware of all that inner work you're doing. And for you, two double cheeseburgers. <laughs> People laugh about that. That's, I'm not fooling. That's exactly how the Spirit works. The Spirit's been doing that with me for 25 years. This kind of little thing is no small deal. I mean, I would, how do you think I kept at it? I needed some, let's have some grace showing up here and everything. And the secret says, law of attraction, and you manifested your double burgers and all. No, I don't have to go there. All I know is that I'm going towards, back towards love, towards abstraction, towards vastness, towards oneness. And I appreciate, I fully appreciated everything. That happens to me every day, those things happen, and it happens to me every week. For example, um, I, I think it was years ago, some years ago, I, did, I was in Cincinnati and I, I was guided to go to a CarMax dealer and to get a, a car. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen very often for hobos, I'll tell you. You're not going shopping uh, with the kind of life I've been living, but occasionally, rarely. It may take years, but it's mm -hmm. I go there, I end up getting this Honda mm -hmm. Civic Hybrid. <laughs> and I thought, and then, th then they were like, do you want a warranty or not? And I said, okay, I'll take the warranty. I never, I never get warranties for anything. It was a rare time. I, the Spirit had me get a warranty. So anyway, recently, 
It was like I was driving around, and I think I was coming back. It was back. a six-year oh. warranty. It was an eight-year. Eight-year. Eight-year eight warranty. Year warranty. Wow. I got an eight-year warranty on it. It was a used car. I got an eight-year warranty on a used wow. car. So anyway, and I'm thinking to myself, this is probably the last car I'll, ever, I'll ascend. <laughs> I will ascend. It, I, I got a nice color. I like it. It's a blue color, an hybrid. I think this is the last car I'm probably ever driving in all in time and space. So you might as well enjoy it. Do you want a warranty? Go ahead. Yeah, throw in the warranty on it. So they throw in the warranty. So I was driving from the monastery, and uh, I never take the car even to the monastery. But it's all dusty and bumpy out there. But I, anyway, I'm driving along, and I'm cruising along, and this is like Utah, so it's not like out here where it's, you know, 60, 70, 80 degrees or whatever. It's still high elevations and everything. And, but this was a really warm day, and I, I noticed I'm driving along, and I'm thinking, huh. I tried to push my air conditioner, and nothing came out. And the, now this is a whim, you know. When you're a mystic and you're a hobo, air conditioning, you know, it's like roll the windows down. That's all I do as I roll the windows down. And then you try to have a conversation you can't hear. You know, What'd you say? <laughs> ah, you know, you've, you're going on the highway. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. Roll the windows down. Yeah. That's fine for me. I can do without air conditioning. But I'm like, what? <laughs> and then you've got your, your gut. Music and you put your great, you've got your CD, your player, and then you've got your iPhone and everything, but you can't hear the music when the yeah. when you're on the highway and the wind's blowing. And so, I, so that's like a win for me. It's like so, so Lisa goes and she checks it out and she's like, well, they say it's going to be there could be a compressor and this and this. She's like, nine hundred, twelve hundred, thirteen, fourteen hundred. I'm like, what? That's like twelve million to me. You know, twelve hundred translates to twelve million. That'll be twelve million dollars. <laughs> when you're a hobo, twelve hundred dollars is twelve million, because you're used to dealing in cents. <laughs> fractions. So I'm thinking. I said, uh, I said, what? I said, if it's a penny over three hundred, forget it. I mean, so then I'm going around, and this is like. I got that warranty six years ago. I'm going around, the Holy Spirit's like, you have a warranty. Mm. So I'm like, I go digging through all my papers. Mystics are hard to collect things. We don't collect <laughs> anything. But i sure I had left all these paperwork. No. I mean, couldn't find it. Dig, dig, dig. I found this little piece of paper and it was like, Honda Civic Hybrid Warranty and it had the number. And I, ah! <laughs> so I just passed it on to somebody and I see what you can do about it. Well that, we just discovered before we came out here that it's, it's, it's all covered. No deductible, nothing. They, they, they had to take it to the Honda dealership because you had to have special tools to do work with a hybrid, and then they had to do this and this. And they're so happy, these, these people, CarMax in Utah. Hello, sir, we're giving you your update. They call updates every day. Updates, updates, zero deductible. It's still free. It's going to take longer. We have, it's more complicated, but we're so happy. You're completely covered. You're completely covered. I love the sound of that, completely covered. <laughs> you see, the Spirit got me that warranty. I never get warranties. I never get warranties for anything. I had that warranty, it was six years, and the Spirit put it back in my mind. Don't forget, you've got a CarMax warranty. It wasn't, they didn't, he couldn't find it in the system, they had to call back to Cincinnati, you know. Those are just, I love those things. It's, it's like icing on the cake. Because I want for nothing. I'm, I'm really content, you know, if the Spirit said, no air conditioning, it's like, okay. Not, you know, it doesn't, it, this was just one of those little, tiny, tiny little whims that come in. And they happen a lot. They've been happening to me for, for over 25 years. It's quite convincing. And, and sometimes people say, what about that? And I, you know, anybody ever remember in the Old Testament of the Bible, there was a guy that I was named after, who goes way back before Jesus, in the Psalms, David. 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 We always, I come out here and there's always Davids in the audience. <laughs> King David. I was named for King David of the Old Testament. How many? Five Davids in the room tonight, well, up over there. Five Davids in the house. Five in the house. There's five Davids in the house. So King David. So anybody remember, how does the 23rd Psalm start? And? I shall not want. Isn't that great? Thousands of years go by and I'm still singing the same song from back then. That's an old song. 
That's an old song. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Lie down, lay it down, lay the world down. Don't try to fix the world, don't try to change it, don't try to make it a better place. Don't try to improve it. And when you have once, what should you do with your once? <coughs> Give them back to the Holy Spirit and say, here, you take it. <laughs> it's not served me. And when you give your wants and your preferences and your desires over to the Holy Spirit and you say, here, I give it to you, then whatever comes back, including these whims, and I mean there's a lots of them. This has not been a sacrificial journey. I've not ever, I don't think I can ever remember in all, in, 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 certainly in recent years, many recent years, where I, I had this thought of, woe is me. You know, you know that's, a, that's not a very enlivening thought, woe is me. Yes. When I saw you, David, I guess some time, it was a year and something ago, and I was crying because I had a roommate who was very ill, and I was taking care of this roommate. She had to have two knee surgeries, she was depressed, she had PTSD, she had all of this. And so I just started praying, and I started, you know, try to give it over. But mostly what I tried to do was forgive her, you know, because she came into my life and I thought she would be a partner and then I get to be her caregiver and that's not how it was supposed to work. And I just worked on forgiveness and I worked on forgiveness and it was very hard. It was so hard for me. Then out of the blue, her social worker has got her a place of her own where she's only paying $300 a month for a very nice place in El Cerrito. She moves over there. She gets her own IHSS worker, a wonderful woman. And our whole relationship changes. I don't have to take care of her anymore. And I start to get happy. You know, I start to like be able to be this friend and care for her in, and have a different relationship with her. <coughs> So she had her knee operation in November, and yesterday she was out walking without her walker. She's better. She's happier. Everybody's happier. So for me, that was like my whim. That was like, okay, this thing that I have of taking care of people, I don't do that anymore. I'm just going to let that go. I'm going to let relationships go. I'm not going to look for someone to be in my life in that way, and I'm going to try to figure out what, how do I get to the inner peace and happiness. Mm -hmm. And I have an opportunity because I don't have this thing that I made in front of me anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, that's it. That's and you said, the thing that you said was, what do you do when you were in a desert? And I was sitting there all crying and stuff. I had no idea. And you said, get out. Leave. Yeah. Leave. Yeah, leave. Yeah, leave. Jesus. You said leave. Jesus did that with Helen Shuckman one time. Describe the course. What do you what do you do when you find yourself in a desert and Helen's like, What is this? Some kind of riddle? What are yeah, you doing? Jesus. What? 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 And then Jesus gives her a little time and then leave. Leave. Yeah. You well, leave the day, desert. I would do that like David said, I'm supposed to leave and I would do that and I would just kinda of let spirit kind of tell me what to do. Yeah, this is what you do. You still have to kind of take care of her. But this other stuff that you've been doing, don't do that. And it just got easier. And it just got easier. And I'll have a roommate. She goes her way. She works. I go my way. I do my thing. And it's so different. It is just so different. Yeah. And I want to thank Spirit and you being the messenger. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful witness because really the only thing that, that actually Spirit would have us give up is the belief in sacrifice. Uh, that thing is so woven down in there with guilt. And you know, and this is where caretaking mm -hmm. in the egoic sense comes in. Dependency, codependency, all the things that the psychologists and psychotherapists say are, are heavy burdens. And, and it's so beautiful that the Course even uses metaphors like that the arc of peace is entered two by two. You really were entering the arc of peace by giving up the heaviness of the idea that you personally mm -hmm. are personally <laughs> responsible for another. Parents have this with children. Partners have this with spouses mm -hmm. and, with, and with mothers and fathers. We do this with the government. We do with, this with the poor. 
We say there's the poor, the needy. Who put them there? Who put the poor and the needy there? You know, Jesus says the ego peopled the world. He uses people as a verb. He uses people as a verb. The ego peopled the world. And now you're regaining the strength of your divine mind by coming back and going, hmm, these thoughts of sacrifice are not my will for, not God's will for me, not my will to hang on to this burden. So actually, isn't that what the Bible, isn't that what all spiritualities teach, that if you will lay down your heavy burdens, mm -hmm. give your burdens to the Lord, mm -hmm. bring these sacrifice, these false responsibility thoughts, false needs, false duties, and so on and so forth, and really we're back to that, our one responsibility is to accept the atonement, which is called the correction. Mm -hmm. Accept the correction in our mind for the error of the ego, and be happy by accepting the correction. That's our one responsibility. He even says at one point, you are not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction. And a lot of people, even who study the Course, they get all caught in this stuff. Well, it's all projection, so I've heard Course teachers say to people, you are responsible for the starving children in Ethiopia. You are responsible. I mean, my God, if, you, if that goes on, you are responsible for the Holocaust, you are responsible for everything. They're trying to use the idea as if you're responsible for everything, but, but actually the true use of that responsible word is for correction. We need to aim our responsibility to our state of mind, which is what you were doing. And I can tell you're a lot happier. You're, yes. you're happier by doing that. And you yes. prayed. You kept praying and praying, you know. Yes. This wasn't kind of trying to dismiss something, push something away or whatever. You actively took it to prayer and then these whims of, of having, we'll say, a roommate that, that helps out with things and so on and so forth, and where you can go and let your creative joy extend and express is, is freed up yes. by this. So, mm -hmm. that's a great witness. Mm -hmm. Sandari. Yeah, um, it's, uh, well, I'm in a raw place, and I have this feeling that the thing that started the real spiraling was asking about trust, like praying for trust, and not even knowing what I was asking of spirit, but a feeling um, that I had lessons to learn about trust. And what seems to have happened is... Um, uh, feeling separation everywhere, and, and it's, it's sort of feeling the ridiculousness of the world, and uh, the rawness, uh, I mean, with the death stuff going on. T today's the first anniversary of my mom's death. And, uh, but just like bodies, and houses, and things, and everything. And it's almost like not being able to connect with anything somehow, just a feeling of um, the illusion of everything around me and like really wanting people, but it's, it's, it just feels uh, like a slippery slope and I feel like there's some, and I've just gotten in a, it's a spiral here of that just in this period. And it's, I have a feeling it's about trust, but I don't see, uh, because I really prayed for that. I mean, and, and, I, and I heard you talking about trust earlier a lot. And I do have, I do think that I really, I mean, that's the last thing I say at night and the first thing in the morning is handing it over, handing over the agenda. And yet, I'm feeling in this spiral of something about trust. And I just wondered if you could speak on that, or anything. Um, I'm, I'm a little lost even what question I want to ask, except I think, I think since trust catalyzed everything going on, that it has something to do with that, that maybe I can't quite even see. Yeah, I think we were in the car today with, with Gia. Gia was taking this around and, 
and Jia had gone through recently a period of high resistance and high fear, and really intense mm -hmm. fear. And we were talking, and and I think on, it was on the way over where you were saying like, when you were letting go, I mean, of of seemingly letting go, even though it was more of an integrating in, it wasn't a real letting go, but but everything that was where the the intensity you had to face the emotions that were arising, so it's like you're doing, you're facing the emotions that are arising. There's like a dismantling that's happening. You're like, instead of fumbling towards ecstasy, you feel like you're tumbling down the rabbit hole. Like, like you are, like Alice, you're going down and, and your limbs are going and there's nothing to grab onto and it's like a tumble. You're like, and then you were saying how, how that, those, those emotions have to be faced. It's the ego that's interpreting what's happening. The ego does not like its own dismantling. Of course it's not going to like that. It, it wants to exist as a separate entity apart from God. It wants to have a personality self and a mask, and it's proud of that mask. When that mask starts to crumble, when Humpty Dumpty takes his big fall off the wall, you know, that's, there's a dismantling. It's almost like a cracking. Maybe you can speak to that, because that was the point. It's, it's the mo most important point of the spiritual journey, is being able to, to face those. And that, that actually was something that built your trust. Yeah. And I think that's actually what's happening to you. Your trust, you've asked for trust, and now it's going to grow and build stronger and stronger. Yeah, because I feel like, you know, this pathway to, and especially if, if it is a pathway of A Course in Miracles, it's actually a bottom-up approach. What it means is that, you know, where the mind is at is to be faced, we're not to bypass anything, to go straight to the ultimate truth and, and constantly affirm the truth and hoping that by affirming it or even understand, understanding it intellectually, we will, that that's achieved, it's not the case, we actually you know, for in my own case, it's definitely a pathway of going through the darkness toward the light and, and allowing the darkness to be revealed to the consciousness in that, that it is exposed to the light and then it will disappear. And I, I remember at the beginning, I asked this question a lot, how to develop trust, because that is almost emphasized a lot in, in the book. Mm -hmm. But it is so much an experience you know, to say that I trust, to say it means nothing. Mm -hmm. And trust is, is, you know, whether we trust or not, we, we know, you know, it's reflected in our daily life how we make decisions. Because it's not that we don't trust, it's who we trusting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the ego, the way that we, we make decisions with the ego, the way that we look at everything, look at ourselves with the ego, and we're trusting that and consistently coming from that perspective or we give over our trust to a much bigger perspective, the Holy Spirit's perspective. And I feel like that is the, the bigger perspective and trust, trusting that is to be developed, actually, because um, we, we have given over all our trust to the ego and and actually Jesus says in the, in the Course that in no circumstances, with no circumstance, do you know your best interest. So, which means that in, in no circumstances, uh, stance do we know how to make decisions to make our, ourselves happy. We mm -hmm. do not know when the mind is so caught up in the egoic way of thinking, it lost, it lose touch with its true identity, it does not know what happiness is anymore. So every single time we make a decision in our life, we actually, you know, basically are choosing happiness or pain. It's really just come down to that. And then what we're practicing, and it's very, very practical, and this trust that that we're developing is is through a very practical application. You know, it's not about more reading, it's not about more group meetings, more talking about it. It actually comes down to every single decision that we're making in our lives. And we have to develop 
this kind of trust by giving over our trust to the Spirit to guide us. And that is a, a very, very important aspect of our practice is that we let go of our decision making and we give it over to someone who truly loves us, mm -hmm. who truly knows our best interests and who truly knows what happiness means to us. And by keep doing that, keep doing that, that is how we develop trust. And eventually, there is no separate thing called the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It is, yes, the experience will come will down to us that is, it is the self, the true self that is still remembering our source and still remembering God, you know, still remembering our self-identity, true identity that is guiding us all along. But what, what we're saying is that it is so practical that let's not forget about our practice. You know, let's not think this spirituality and our daily lives are actually separate, mm -hmm. that we can just come talk about it once a week. But, mm -hmm. you know, in every single decision is our choice of what we're developing and what we're strengthening. Can I ask a question in mm -hmm. this very uh, line of thinking? Mm -hmm. So when you're in this process and your goal each day is, well, all the time, is, okay, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm doing. Did you ever, either one of you, find that you get to this point where you, here's what I get to. I feel like I want to hear the right one, not the wrong one. Because I want, I'm really trying to engage in the life that I'm calling, that I've called to do, without knowing from day to day what it's going to be. So, does it, the Course says something like, it doesn't really matter what you do. Either, that, either the Course says it or you've said it, David, that the Spirit doesn't care so much about the doings that we do, and yet we're asked... We, I know that the joy comes from when I hear it and I follow it is joy. So is there always a right and wrong to what you're hearing? Is that how you discern? Does my do question mean, make any you, sense? Do you mean right by joy? Is that joy you mean? Well, it, sometimes it's, it, I feel like there must be something I'm called to do. Mm. And I know it gives me the joy, but I—it's it, very difficult to discern. Yeah. I mean, remember years ago I had that question, and and I think it was around 2001. I was doing a gathering, and I started <coughs> using the World Trade Center. Uh, it wasn't 2001. It was probably back in the 1990s, maybe 1991, because I guess the trade centers came down in 2001. So it was about oh, a yeah. decade mm -hmm. before the World Trade Centers. Collapsed, and I was using the World Trade Center metaphor that it's like the, the mind when it's caught up in the ego, it's like it's got all these floors, like the World Trade Center, and you're like on the surface where the flag is blowing, and there's all these beliefs underneath. Every decision you make is filled, is coming from, is a byproduct of all these thoughts and beliefs that are unconscious. You know, Jung called it the shadow, the okay. unconscious mind, mm -hmm. and I said. And, and really it's like starting off at the top floor and going down and t turning on the lights on all the, in all the darkened rooms until you light up the whole, <laughs> I said this like a decade before the, the towers got lit up, you have to light them all up and, and that can seem like a very long process to light up every dark closet room in the entire World Trade Center. It can seem to take an enormous amount of time to light all that up. However, I said, if you can get into the basement, mm. there is a master switch. Mm. You can light the whole place up at once with the master switch in the basement. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what you're asking. You're asking me the difference between the right mind, this lined up with God and Spirit, and okay. the wrong mind, which is lined up with the ego. Right. That's light and darkness. That's love and fear. Never the twain will meet. You know, it, it's when you bring them together, the darkness disappears. Okay. The master switch is like the atonement. Now the key is, you're asking, how do I tell the difference between the two? How do I know what's right and what's wrong? Right-minded thoughts, wrong-minded thoughts. It's really causation. 
every belief, every belief, every thought you have that believes in an external world that's supposedly apart from your mind, people that are apart from you, countries, events, events even, even aliens, the idea that there's life on other planets and we have visitors and all this, everything a part of the projection that teaches you that there's something causative outside of mind or outside of your consciousness is a wrong-minded thought. Everything. If you believe that there's an atom, just an atom or an electron apart from your consciousness, or let's say Mars, you know, if you say Mars is outside of my mind, Mars is not in my mind, it's far, far away, no it's not, you know. Everything in the cosmos, all the black holes, everything is in mind. There's nothing but mind. There's no physical universe. That's what quantum physicists is they're showing us now. For, they've been doing this for six, almost seven decades, saying now that there is no world apart from consciousness. Yeah. That if you change, if the experimenter has a different assumption or a different thought, it will change the experiment. Yeah. It, quantum physics is teaching the same thing that Jesus has been teaching, and all the mystics and saints, that there is no external world. So a wrong-minded thought is just the thought that there's something outside of you. And the one final realization, the very simple realization that I call enlightenment, is that there is nothing outside of you. There is nothing outside of, of the I am. That the I am presence, that the, 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 there's nothing outside the mind. When people say, what about physical sickness? There is, that's a contradiction in terms. It's all mental illness. It's all just holding on to thoughts and beliefs that God didn't create. So every illness is mental illness. We're not just talking about mental retardation. Cancer is mental illness. Heart disease is mental illness. Being sad is mental illness. You know, being, feeling guilty is mental illness. So to me, that was what I, I took this process. I said, all right, Jesus, I need a lot of help. I need a lot of help, but I'm here for you. I'm going to really go for this. And he said, good, I've been waiting for this. Yeah. <laughs> let's, get, let's get busy. And, and that really is the, the difference, is thinking of anything external and thinking that it has causation. Thinking that the radiation from the sun is causative. Thinking that, that, um, that there's such a thing as a, as, a, as a disease, as a transmitted disease, as a sexually transmitted disease. Thinking that there's germs that are flying through the air, you know. All of science, that uh -huh. it's empirical science, Newtonian science, that shows you, that tries to actually magnify it and say, no, there are germs. You've got to be careful and watch out for germs. As if these external things can give you dis-ease. It's crazy. It's bizarre. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, you know. But I have, but I just see past the forms. When I go on a flight and I'm over in Asia and they're all wearing the mask and everything, <laughs> and I still, oh, it looks so adorable, but they have the mask on everything. I can't make sense of it. I can't make sense of any of that stuff. I don't even believe in that stuff, but I, they're adorable. Everybody's just adorable. Because why? Because they're all in my mind. I mean, I have people after 20 some years, 25 years of doing this, they'll, they'll come to me and they'll say, how so and so? Like, I haven't seen so-and-so for 20 years. I say, they're great. Even though I haven't seen them for 20 years, I know they're great. Why are they great? Because I'm great. They're me. They have to be great. Everyone in the universe is doing great. How's Donald Trump doing? He's doing great. Why? Because he's in my mind. <laughs> You've got Trump, Donald Trump in your mind? Well, and the rest of all the, <laughs> the rest of the cosmos too. You know, it's the sameness that David was talking about. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? They're all the same. Mm -hmm. Why are they the same? Because I'm the same. Mm -hmm. I'm the same spirit, they're the same spirit. Mm -hmm. Now that's non-judgment. You know, that's, that'll put an end to politics in a hurry. It's hard to be political <laughs> if everything's the same. <laughs> when people say, who are you going to vote for? I'm like, vote? It's a strange idea. I used to take it very seriously, believe me, <laughs> I used to take it very seriously. But once you start to see that, you know, they'll talk about manifesting, the whole key to awakening is seeing that there is no manifesting. It's impossible to manifest. That's why I only have a small room full instead of 
hundreds of people lining up. Doesn't that contradict what you said just earlier about when you when you finally see the love and, and that's all there is? I would consider the word manifesting being now that you see the expressions of that in everything. So maybe if I'm just changing the definition, because I experience that when I'm yeah. in love. Oh my gosh, everything is so beautiful, and that's what I. That's the verb I use on that process. Yeah. Is that? Accurate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a merge. It's, it's, it's a useful, it's a useful stepping stone, but in the end, the reflections, of course, they're so all... reflections would yes. be a better term. Okay. They're all the same, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you really let go of the outcomes of your decisions when you know, when you feel, okay, I've listened, I'm going to follow, rather than say, well, wait, why would I do that? Yeah, it's, you know, to me it gets so simple, you know. I'll be just like feeling all this love and everything, and then I hear this old Ray Stevens song in my mind from ages ago. Yeah. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, and black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And then he breaks into his song. Everything is beautiful in its own way. You know, it's like, oh my God, it's so much love. Old Ray Stevens song. And, you know, I, I get, just have a lot of these songs. The Spirit is like serenading me in my mind. All these love songs, love songs. But they're not like, they're not like personal kind of love songs. They're like love songs for everyone and everything. They don't have a limit. And that's what we're talking about. The, then you start to see everything as reflections, because it has to it has to spread out. Like it, it has to become like like there has to be a merge finally with the reflections, so that you you mm -hmm. see even reflections kind of implies an inner and an outer. Uh -huh. inner. But we already heard today from Ami that the inner and God is the inner, God is the outer, God is here, God is there. It's it's everything. So it, it that all has to collapse too. Yeah. Eventually, it all collapses. Mm -hmm. Research and medical research, like if you eat green vegetables and avoid McDonald's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you should be less likely to get diabetes and all that. Or at least for the unenlightened, doesn't that have some validity? Or? No, it's symbols. It's, um, it's like it's all causation. That ultimately, the spirit is like saying, "Here's your playground of all these images you made." The Holy Spirit neutralized it all. Remember those experiments when we were in chemistry and. And we, we put in the neutralizer and everything gets neutralized. All the acid gets neutralized. Mm -hmm. It's like the acidic nature of sin has been neutralized. In one instant, sin was neutralized. That's good news. It's, whoosh, just God, this Holy Spirit neutralized error and sin in one instant. That's how long it took. Now to accept that instant, you start to draw, you could say there's reflections. People do that, they'll say, they'll say, I was diagnosed with cancer, and then I just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and finally the Spirit said, here, I want you to eat leafy green vegetables, I want you to change your diet. That's no small thing for most human beings, change your diet. Mm -hmm. I'm used to having burgers, and bacon burgers, <laughs> and triple meat burgers, and all those things. Yeah. And now what, what did you say, Jesus? Green vegetables. Ah! <laughs> God! <laughs> And for some, they go, okay, I'm so willing, and then they eat the leafy green vegetables and everything, they change their diet 100%, and, and their symptoms go away. And they go, thank you, I, I followed God, He told me to change my diet, I changed my diet. In the same way with people who, who have an alcoholic problem, a lot of times they pray, they go through 12 steps, they go through a, a renewing of their mind, they they, they give over control to the higher power, and they say, I will do whatever, I will follow, I want to heal, and then they, they stop drinking. Some, some of them will never touch an alcoholic drink ever again in their entire lifetime. Others kind of reach this place where they start getting all lovey-dovey, and then they get into the thirteenth step. They're like, what? The Course in Miracles is their thirteenth step. Mm -hmm. oh. The continuing practice, you know, a connection with the higher power. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden the course slips in and they go, oh boy, 13th mm -hmm. step. Wow, I didn't know that was there. And then they dive into that and they go, oh wow, this is purification. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Whew, this is full stuff. But that's a step along the way. 
that's a whim for somebody who's, who has cancer and who is saying, I want to be cancer free so I can go on with my lessons. I'm not ready to check out quite so fast. Yeah, that's, a, that's magic, but it's still a, a, a miraculous expression that Jesus and the Holy Spirit use all kinds of symbols along the way. So that can definitely be one. People exercise, they eat, and this and this. They still try to tell me the difference between organic and inorganic. I don't get it. But, that's what happens when you're going for enlightenment. <laughs> she says, cost. <laughs> You'll pay twice the amount, right? Just twice as much for a burger and twice as much for organic. You know, and everything. It's all symbols, so we have to, to do that. We, Francis and I, um, one time we went over, we were in um, Aarhus, Denmark, and we got invited to this loft. To, this man opened up his loft in a in like a, a real factory kind of district. And so we're there and we're going to go to this loft over, what's it, like a weekend or something? This man, several days or whatever, four day, retreat. four day retreat. And outside of the loft, right across from when you come out of the loft and you're in this kind of district, there's a slaughterhouse. There's a slaughterhouse <laughs> right across from the loft. And the loft has been donated for us to do it. So every day we go up, we go do our gathering, we come down, and then the next day, up and down, and people would come up into the loft, they would be sick. Um, <laughs> they would be sick just walking right by a slaughterhouse and coming up to our gatherings. Now the Holy Spirit had to have set that up, because, you know, the Holy Spirit is trying to get us into the sameness of all things, and we people are walking. Through. So I think one of the days, I, I love everything, so I, I came down, and I went, and I just went over to the slaughterhouse, and here were all these rows. These cattle were going through these rows, and then they were going right into the slaughterhouse. So we had a lot of telepathic communication. I, w I went and I was gazing into the eyes of these cows, and basically, and they were like looking at me, and they were very frightened, you know, that was what was happening. I was looking at them with all this love and compassion, and they were very frightened, and they were very confused, like, what is happening? What is happening here? We, we had this communication going on and everything. But again, in the experience that Christ talks about, where you see there's no external world, all that was was opportunities to send love and blessing. And isn't that what we have every day? With our family members, with our co-workers, with our friends, with our pets and our animals, and sometimes in our, we love our pets so much, we cuddle them, we love them, we feel completely joined and one with our pets. And yet here was a situation where I'm, I'm looking in the eyes of, of cattle that are in line to be slaughtered. And I was just telling him, with great assurance, everything is alright, everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Like you might comfort a child who is having a nightmare, or a person, a friend, you you comfort, you bless, you have all the love in the universe in your heart, you want to extend that. And so that's what I was, I was just doing, just extending that. Well, and also then when we get into the sessions, <coughs> those are kind of a lot of the questions. We got asked about vegetarianism, killing, suffering, suffering um, loving all sentient beings, what does that mean, what is a sentient being? You know, what does that mean? We got asked all the questions, all the Buddhist questions, all the questions of the universe come into our gatherings because it was a setup to have a, a four-day retreat right across from the slaughterhouse. It just was given us to do that. So then we, we go into these concepts very, very deep and then I'll have like vegetarians writing to me, David, you murderer! You know, people, <laughs> they, it's like they project all the thoughts. And I'm simply teaching that when you're totally aligned with, with Spirit, you, you are the love, you extend the love, and that's all we're here to do is extend the love. Everything that seems to be an external world, including external animals, is just an opportunity to extend the love. And it's very much like the forgiveness that you talked about. For many people they were like, well this is steep forgiveness, this is really steep forgiveness. And sometimes it does seem that way. But but we have to be convinced by the Spirit that we are the One. Like in, everyone likes the Matrix. Yes. Neo, Neo, you shift those letters around and it's One. You are the One. 
we're being told that by the Spirit all the time, but we have to be convinced of it. And as long as we believe there is an external world, then we believe in murder. We believe it's possible to murder the Christ, to murder the Buddha, uh, because the Buddha is one, the Christ is one. We believe in an external world, we're denying the Buddha, we're denying the Christ. So this is very practical at coming to wholeness and completion, not by airy-fairy, not by skipping things over, putting blinders on, turning the, turning the other way, saying, I don't even want to see that. No, you have to be willing, like a friend of mine, a, a student of mine for way back, you know, she, whatever she would have a real difficult issue with, I would would work with her. Like she, she hated Christian tele-evangelists, you know. <laughs> Okay, be saved in the blood of Jesus and now donate. We only need $700 to reach our goal today, but we'll give you a little flower here. And if you go into the next category of a thousand, we'll give you a, a purple flower. And this is, oh, she hated televangelists and she hated them with a passion. So I said, well, I think you should turn on the 700 Club <laughs> uh, and turn on a cable TV channel that's just, I said, watch them all day. But I said, take notes of your emotions. Watch your televangelists, and she's like, just hated, hated those televangelists. But it was part of her forgiveness. She's getting in touch with her thoughts, her judgmental thoughts of the televangelists. Then another time, uh, I said, oh, come and watch The Matrix with me. At first she was going to watch The Matrix, and she's, oh, I said, watch The Matrix. No, I can't. It's such a violent movie. It's too violent. It's too violent. Too violent. She said, I'll give it a try. She could only watch five minutes of The Matrix, and then she turned it off. Too violent. So then I said, why don't you go back to The Matrix now and journal, pause and journal all your thoughts about The Matrix movie. Guns, bullets, just, you know, whatever. Just journal, journal, journal. She did, and eventually she came to me where she watched The Matrix enough and journaled enough that she said, come David, I'm taking you out to the IMAX theater to watch The Matrix with me. So we went to the IMAX theater, we sat like in the third row, like this. Trinity's nose was this big. You know, like, God, when, you're, when you're in the third row of IMAX, you know, it's everything. Neo, Trinity, yeah, everything's like this. And she sat there with me the whole movie. We watched the entire Matrix. And she didn't have one violent thought. She was like a little girl. She was so happy at all the teachings. You are the one. All the things were coming through. And then at the end, we sat there in the theater and we could hear the comments of all the people around us, how wonderful, all the meanings they saw, how excited they were. So she drew forth all these reflections of, of wisdom and clarity and let go, because I tell people there is no such thing as a violent movie. Judgment in the mind is violent. What did Jesus teach? Judge not, lest you be judged. You know. It's in the mind. It's not the movies. I've never ever seen a violent movie. Once I realized that the judgment was in the mind and I let go of the judgment, I could sit there and watch Cape Fear, uh, Dog Day After, what's the one, some of those movies, um, what's some of the most gruesome, Psycho, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, <laughs> I could watch them all, you know, I, I would just be there, nope, nothing, you know, go to the scariest, was there some Hitchcock movies, or The Ring, or, you know, it, you know, it, it didn't matter. What was that one um, with Brad Pitt and Gwyneth Seven. Paltrow? Seven. Yes. Seven. All the seven deadly sins, it's so, what's the second lesson of A Course in Miracles? I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. There are no violent movies. You see how, how deep this is. I mean, I've watched a movie on the Dalai Lama. I did a whole session with a group. It was The whole movie was Awakening. It was, the, it was the story of the Dalai Lama. And after we watched this movie, it was a couple hours, and it was they, they took a lot of the progressive thinkers from the West, Fred Allen Wolf, um, some of the ones that you see in What the Bleep, you know, the quantum physicists, all of them went over there, all these progressive Western thinkers, to, to spend time with the Dalai Lama. 
They got sick. The progressive secretaries got yeah. sick. They argued with each other. They had quantum physicists arguing. You're trying to dominate the conversation. No, shut up. You, did, <laughs> you see all these great pillars out here in the Bay Area, all the stuff we, you know, all these progressive thinkers. You get them in there with the Dalai Lama in India, and they're way out of their comfort zones. You know, they're saying, I've got an ego, I know I do, but I'm upset about this and this. And it just was like this. So we did that as a mind watcher to show how deep this goes. How deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go? You know, we, can we get to the point, like the lady in the movie, when they were starting to try to get into action, like we should do something about the Chinese and, and this oppression and, and this dominance and chasing you out of Tibet. I think he was chased out of Tibet in like 1959. They showed footage of him having to be disguised as a regular person and they had to get him out of Tibet. So finally, they get all these progressive thinkers, and they're trying to come up with how how can we solve this Tibet issue? And one lady stands up and she says, "I think we need to look at the Tibet in our own minds." <laughs> this lady stands up and it's like, "Whoa, get the speck, you know, get the log out of your own eye before you get the speck out of your brother's eye." Is what Jesus taught. He was teaching about perception two thousand years ago. Purify your perceptions. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. If someone smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Yeah! Let's go for the completion of this thing. It's beyond reincarnation. Hallelujah! It's beyond karma. Hallelujah! I went into a shop the other day. I was in Park City, Utah, and I went in and it was, what was it called? Good Karma. Good Karma. I go into Good, good Karma to have a, a tea, a chai tea. And I went in and I go, oh, I got my iPhone out and I said, uh, what's your password for your Wi-Fi? They said, instant karma. <laughs> John Lennon song, instant karma. Instant karma is going to get you. It's going to knock you right up in the side of the head. Better get yourself together. Pretty soon you're going to be dead. Why in the world are we here? You don't have to live in pain and fear. And why on earth are you there when you're everywhere, everywhere, going to get your share? John Lennon, quantum physics, Beatles, it's everywhere. I, you should see how happy I was. I'm like, look at this, the password is instant karma. My favorite John Lennon song is the, is the password for the Wi-Fi. Another whim. It's like me getting two double cheeseburgers for two fifty. It's all. It doesn't take it's much for same. me. It's all the same. It's it's glorious when when you just start to see that the, the universe is just singing to us all the time, like it's it's singing. Wake up! What's Gia's new blog blog talk thing going to be? What? Wake up now. Wake up now. She, we were helping her come up with a. She wants to do a blog blog talk. What is it called? Podcast. podcast. She wanted to do a podcast, so she wanted to come up with a name, so she, she came up with it. We were all like, yes, wake up now. I don't think that's copyright. <laughs> I think that's universal. Yes? Yeah, I was just going to say, I grew up on a farm, and so we did have to slaughter our animals and things yeah. like that. But our dad taught us that you, you thank it, you bless it, and you extend gratitude. And have, just like the happiness you had when you had instant karma, so it. And I think the Native Americans also honored their um, animals, and, and so I think there's a lot to learn from that. Yeah. And I also wanted to mention when you first saw it, you you um, talked about Pollyanna, like it, it's sort of a derogatory way, like people think we're Pollyannas. Well, I don't know if you've ever read the book about Pollyanna, but she learned how to play the happy game. Yes. And yeah. I don't think it's such a derogatory yes. thing to have to be it called isn't. Pollyanna. Yeah, I know the story of Pollyanna, so yeah. I, it's, it just kind of gets a negative exactly. connotation. Yeah. But actually, it what, it, it, I don't understand that either. I think it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. good to be have happy stories like that. Yeah. And you might have remembered Marla Morgan's book, Mute Message Down Under, where the Aborigines, mm -hmm. you know, they would basically... They would like have, they would have people that would go out like hunters, but they would telepathically communicate that this one is giving up for the service of of of, of, of joy, for the service of div divinity. This one's choosing to give up. It was there was no accidents. It wasn't the killers and the victims. 
it was like all telepathic. That, that, you know, when the Bible says all things work together for good, there are no, the Course says there are no exceptions, except in the ego's judgment, that even what we would say a slaughterhouse, even what we would say Nazi Germany, uh, or what went on with Stalin, and, and we look at throughout human history, the, the ego doesn't want the mind to see that all of the world is a dance. It's really one happy dance, which, in which everything is working together for good. It's the highest state of mind. And only the ego splits it up into, again, the split gets projected from consciousness out there to the victim, the victimizer, the one who's done to, and the one who's doing the doing. You know, it, it's a whole projection of cause and effect when actually there are no causes and effects in the world. All of our sciences, except now quantum physics is going past that, but our Newtonian sciences are based on, for every action there's a reaction. Physics is even based on false cause and effect. So, you know, for me that's what was good about those ten years of university, is I learned all this stuff about how the world operates. And then I got to a point where it's like, do you want to be happy? You're going to have to let it go now. All of it. Because all of those cause-effect relationships are spurious. It's all a decision. Nothing happens to anyone by accident. Not even to the animals. You know, it's not like, you know, people would say, well, who would choose to be slaughtered? That's a wrong-minded thought and a wrong-minded decision. You know, no one in their right mind would choose to be sick. No one in their right mind would choose to die. No one in their right mind would choose to suffer. It brings it back to that question about, I want to know more about the discernment between the right mind aligned with God, Spirit, and the wrong mind, the egoic mind. That's a good question. That's what I've spent the last 25 years doing. I literally gave up academia, I gave up ambition, I gave up pursuits, family, all kinds of things. Not as a sacrificial way, but because I, it was too important for me to wake, wake up and to discern with God, to live a life in alignment with God. That was too important. I was willing to let go everything else for that one pursuit. Uh, you know who Muruji is? Mm -hmm. So this morning I heard him say, the only goal is to have no goal. Mm -hmm. Is that what you would agree with that? I would say that while you believe in goals, then the peace of God is a good goal. Peace of mind. While you, but the ambitions and all but of But it's not a future goal. In other words, most of the time people associate, what Muji is basically saying is, have no goal, is have no future goal. And, and yet, anybody who knows any spiritual discipline will take, it takes discipline and devotion on this path. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, oh, how do I twink my nose? Do I, yeah. for enlightenment, twink, twink, <laughs> click, click with the heels. <laughs> no, it, it takes devotion and it takes practice. We were talking about trust, how, didn't you say that to somebody one time when somebody asked you how to trust? I was told. You were told. I, I was asking. And you were asking. I was told. Uh, what did I? I asked how to develop trust, and I was told um, to the way to develop trust is start trusting. Mm -hmm. and start going that direction. Mm -hmm. and don't wait. Yeah. yeah. It's a practice. Mm -hmm. And it's a practice until it becomes a state of mind. So, in other words, we never say skip over the practice. There's a lot of non-dual teachings that will just say, you are that, and everyone's like, in the audience, okay, you know, it's like, uh, all right, you know, we, we're saying, no, there's an experience that you are that, really, it's, it's true, but if, but practice, the, the Course in Miracles for me was a practice. The Course in Miracles to me is by far the greatest book on the entire planet. And I love it because, first of all, it says it's only one path on the universal curriculum. It doesn't proclaim it's the only way. Mm -hmm. Don't you like that about a, a teaching that doesn't proclaim it's the only way? <laughs> I like that. I'm like, oh good, That's, that gets my attention. Mm -hmm. The other thing about it is, though, it's, it's from Jesus. Now Jesus is an actual awakened mind. He actually is that thing that Byron Katie talks about, loving what is. That is, is Christ, is, call it whatever name you want, that's that. So, so it's a practical tool with a, a, 
a manual, a workbook, and a, and a, a text. And it's just the pathway I took. Now, now is it any better than any other path? No, it's all the same. The course is the same as everything to me. I mean, I've taught classes where I would welcome people to write things on their exams, and uh, one of my students, I said, pick some, pick a topic that's dear to you, and write about it on your final exam. So one of my students wrote on Satanism. I thought, that's delightful. I'm going to love reading this exam on Satanism. And sure enough, I found some really nice thoughts. He had some really good thoughts that really resonated with me. But he just called it Satanism. Nobody, I don't even believe in this idea of separate beliefs now. You know, I, it was my responsibility to love everyone and to see that this <coughs> idea of separate people having separate beliefs is crazy. You know, I don't care what they say they believe. Atheism, great! Ah, come here! I'm an agnostic. Oh, great! Uh, let me give you a hug. Uh, I'm a Satanist. Okay, give me a hand, give me a hug. You know, I don't really care what people profess to believe in, because why? It's not true. There's not a single belief that's true. Not even a single one. What did the Beatles say? All you need is love. Da, 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 da. Do we know that's true? Oh, we can feel the resonance. When we sing that song, we can sing it with our hearts because we know that love is all there is. Love is all there is. You know, that's the thing. And, and yet, we also have to, to see that no beliefs are true. So, that's why I'm not trying to see who's got the correct beliefs or the right beliefs when they're all insane. The ego made up the beliefs. We should have a clue about the beliefs from the idea that the ego made them up. God wasn't like, oh, I think I'm going to create some beliefs now. I'll create some different beliefs, some separate beliefs. No way. That's not the creator of love, you know. So, so in the end, it's not really important what you believe, except I would say to forgive is a belief too, and that's the one belief that you devote your life to. It's still an illusion because in heaven there's nothing to forgive, but while you believe you're on earth, it's safe to aim for that one. And that's a good good belief. Is it time? I've got to touch my watch because it's only that will watch it. Okay, well, I hope we have some time to hug and share some things. Oh, and there's a there's some uh, flyers, too. Let's see. Um, there's a donation basket out there. And if you want to write a check, it's to Living Ministries, Church. Living Church Ministries, Inc. And um, Dave's going to be at uh, Tony's Community Miracle Center on May 22nd. Yes. And in San Francisco. And then um, there's a conference he's going to be at in Estes Park, Colorado, June 16th to 18th, $299 retreat fee. Weekend of so Freedom. Some, hmm? We're weekend of Freedom, where I'm sure we'll get into the idea of what do you want, freedom of the body or freedom of the mind, for okay. both you cannot have. That's an weekend interesting topic. For both, you cannot have. It's Again, the spirit pointing the direction. To us. <laughs> it's also uh, Gary Renard's there, and Maria Felipe, and Doug Fishman. And Craig. So there's I mean, there's some other people, and if any of you are interested, there's some flyers. They would have books on the table out there, and people will know if they want them how much they are. How does one know? Right. Is that printed? Out at the back. Is it's printed out on the back or something? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> There's some spirit will <laughs> show you the price somewhere. And thank you all for coming. And thank yeah, you thank for you. coming. And you. One more announcement. On May 7th, Kirsten and Ricky from Living Miracles will be in San Rafael at Jim. It's um well, there is a flyer here from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And it's at her place. 
probably on the website too, and like livingmiracles.org. The, the, the other two things is there's a pad of paper. I'm like, this was very quick. This was like a week that I knew you were coming or a week yes, and a half. Yes, very spontaneous. I mean, this, this, you know, happened really fast. So if for some reason I don't have your email, um, if things, you know, happen fast and you want to know there's a pad of paper where you could just put your name and email and then I would find out. And um, probably would just find out anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's some food back there. There's some fruit and chips and stuff. And there's teas here. And besides those teas, I have millions of other teas in case you have urges for teas. <laughs> and, uh, the coffee, you kind of make yourself. Whims, tea whims, right tonight. Here. It's all the same. Guess your right? tea is. That's right. Like, <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And we have lifts for back up the hill if you'd like. Uh, definitely. Oh, so. you're serious? No, yeah, of course. No, 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 no. Um, and lift to Bart for whoever you know needs that, or unless somebody's going by that way. And um, my son and I, in case you heard this week, Spooks, there's a tall and quiet, invisible guy here who's <laughs> <laughs> helping to get people where they want to go. So we can give you lifts up the hill. That's fine. And yeah. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Thank you.